Father, we ask that you would keep us as the apple of your eye today, to hide us in the shadow of your wings, to keep us from the wicked who seek out violence, from deadly enemies who surround us. We pray this prayer especially right now, God, for our brothers and sisters around the world who are in various dangerous cities, for the threat of their lives because of their faith in you, We pray that you would keep them close to your hearts. God, we do pray for peace within this world today. Uh, Between Russia and Ukraine, we pray for peace and not war. We pray for justice. And God, we also pray for your spirit to destroy the plans of the terrorist groups throughout the world, in the Middle East, especially in this day, ISIS, Taliban, Al-Qaeda. We pray that every one of their plans would end in vain, that they would not come to fruition for the violence and destruction that they seek out. But God, instead, your peace would rule and reign in the nations, in the cities, but also in the hearts of these terrorists that they would find Christ, repent, and become men and women of peace. Father, we pray also for our brothers and sisters to the north of us, in camps, in prisons, in hiding. We also pray that you would embrace them with strength and joy today. God, this world is in need of you, and we cry out for your mercies and your grace to be released in new measure so that the nations would come to know the saving grace, the life-changing grace that is found in Christ alone. We pray for that grace and that peace to be released in the hearts of the people gathered here today as well. God, we want to honor you today. This is your time. We have gathered in your name to lift up the name of Jesus and his name alone. So may we all hide behind the cross as we exalt the matchless name of Jesus. And Jesus, would you receive all glory, honor, and praise that is due your name. And Father, I ask that you would strengthen me now by your Spirit. Holy Spirit, I invite you to fill me, overflow through me, anoint me, empower me, and preach through me today so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be pleasing in your sights. O Lord, our rock, our Redeemer, and it is in the precious and matchless name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You know, I'm so happy that my uh, two-and-a-half-year-old son, Enoch, is a little bit organized, and he's showing signs of organizational skills, like me. Uh, You know, he likes to park all of his matchbox cars. He has, like, I think over 50 now. And he likes to organize and arrange them, you know, and park them right next to each other. And he takes his stuffed animals and arranges them and orders them together. And even if there's, like, a, a strand of hair that falls in between his cars or his animals, he'll tell me, Daddy, get rid of that hair, you know, um... And uh, when I see his organizational skills, I can confidently say, that's my son, you know. Uh, And it also seems like for now, Enoch seems to be ambidextrous. He's very comfortable using both his left and his right hands, doing major motor skills. And I can also confidently say, that's my son. He also likes to preach and to pray into his toy microphone. I don't know where he gets that from, but I can also say that that's my son. But when he transforms into another person when he gets hungry, I can confidently look at my wife and say, that's your son. Uh, Because she may or may not uh, also resemble that, too. 
And also, uh, he, my son became fluent in Korean already as a two-year-old. I knew eventually he would exceed my Korean skills. I just did not expect it to happen when he was two years old. Uh, you know, sometimes when he's sleepy, he would invite me to come and lay down at the bed, and he'll tell me, um, uh, 옛날 옛날 얘기해줘, meaning uh, in Korean that's, tell me like a fairy tale, like, you know, once upon a time, tell me that kind of thing. And so, because my wife will often do that before he falls asleep. And so, I try in my Korean, and then he'll kind of stop me and say, 못해? <laughs> meaning, you can't do it? Dad, you can't, you can't see that? And so I try again, and then he calls his mommy, mommy, can you come here? Because daddy can't. Uh, and so I think he is aware of my limited Korean skills already. Um, so that was very humbling. <laughs> and that's also what I can say to my wife, that's your son, right? Uh, you see, there is a resemblance that family members have to each other. There are traits that distinguish the uniqueness of families uh, one to another. And you know, one of our former admins, Estella, she would often tell us how when she would walk through the streets of her hometown of San Francisco and run into some Koreans she's never met before, they would often stare at her. And uh, she'd be like looking at them, what are you looking at? And finally they would be like, are you Mr. Kang's daughter? And she would be like, yes, who are you? And it was because she resembled her father so much that these strangers would just take one look at her and they would recognize who her father is. You see, family members resemble each other in looks, in traits, in lifestyles, and in values. And the question that we want to ask ourselves today is when people look at your life, can they recognize your father in heaven? When people find out you're a Christian, does your life reflect what his family looks like? So we want to ask, then, what do God's children look like? And how are God's children supposed to live? And that's what we want to explore today as we continue our study through uh, Peter's first letter. Uh, and as he also unpacks for us today traits and characteristics of children of God. How to live as children of God. That's the question we want to explore today. So turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 13 and following as we explore how we are to live as children of God. Follow along with me in your outline as well. There's a few traits that Peter will highlight for us today as to Mark's of true children of the Lord. And the first is this, that we are to live a life of hope. So everyone repeat, live a life of hope. All right, so uh, one key trait of children of God is a life that is lived in hope. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So now, after reminding the church, uh, the suffering church, that these trials are momentary and that our focus should always be on Christ, as we looked at last week, that the point of our lives is to point people to Jesus. Now Peter gives further instructions as to how the children of God are fully to live in light of this reality. And if there's one trait that children of God are to be marked with, it is hope. So let's say that again, hope. All right, Because a true faith in Christ and a true understanding of God's promises for his people will not result in fear or worry or pessimism. Because only, the only fear that remains in the heart of a believer is a fear of God. And when you have a fear of God in your heart, you don't need to fear anything else. Therefore, true faith in Christ and his promises results in hope. God's people are a hope-filled people. And Peter stresses this point very heavily in verse 13. So he says, preparing your mind for action. Now, this phrase carries the meaning of focused conviction. 
as if you were preparing to go into war. So if you suited up in, with armor and guns and you're about to step off an airplane into the battlefields of Iraq to face terrorists, it is crucial that your mind is focused and that you are convicted about the task in front of you. You will not last long in the battlefield if you don't have conviction about being there. If you waver as you step off the plane in a battlefield, you're walking into some serious danger. And not only are we to prepare our minds for action, again, focused conviction, but also he says that we are to be sober-minded, meaning to have clarity of thoughts, clarity of mind to clear away the clutter of our minds. Because if someone is drunk, uh, they can't think straight, they can't talk straight, they can't walk straight, and we see this all the time in the streets of Korea. Korea is a very heavy drinking culture. It doesn't matter if it's nighttime or not. Uh, but we are called to have sober minds, meaning clear thinking and conviction in our thoughts as well. But about what? What are we to have clear thinking and clear convictions about? He explains that also in verse 13. So let's look at verse 13 again. So therefore, preparing your minds for action, okay, conviction, being sober-minded, clarity, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the conviction and clarity is to help us focus our attention fully on the hope that we have in Christ. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That there will be great grace for us when Jesus returns in glory. So he's saying, so focus with conviction that Jesus is returning and he is returning for you who have trusted in him. He is coming in power. He is coming to fully heal and restore all things. He will come to wipe away every tear from our eyes and you'll be restored to fullness of health and you will experience fullness of joy because in his presence is the fullness of joy. And you will experience at his return the delights of seeing loved ones who have gone before you, but then you will never have to say goodbye again. You know, when I was visiting Handong University earlier this year at the retirement ceremony for President Kim, um, I was really looking forward to also seeing a lot of my former colleagues uh, that I was working together with for those several years that I was there. Um, and it's been like over 13 years since I've seen them. And uh, before the ceremony started, I got into the main sanctuary a little bit early and I was sitting in the aisle, uh, the aisle row, right in the middle of the aisle. And so as people were coming in, suddenly all of the f faculty and staff started uh, walking down the middle aisle to the front area to be seated. And as I looked behind me, suddenly I saw one after the other, old friends and colleagues and people that I used to do life together with and did ministry together with. And they had like 50 or 60 of their staff and faculty there. And as I saw one after the other, it was so wonderful to see these old friends that I haven't seen. It wasn't just like one or two. It was like one after the other, 50 to 60 people lined up old friends that I had forgotten about or we did not know where we were or what we were doing anymore and for those brief moments we were catching up and it was wonderful to see and also a little bit sad to see you know a little bit more wrinkles a little bit more gray hair and a little bit more you know body parts shifting and changing shapes and stuff like that but I still recognize them you know and uh, as we were catching up it was beautiful because I felt like I was getting a taste of heaven because also when we enter glory, there will be a line of people waiting to greet you as well. People who have gone before us, people whom we have prayed for, people who prayed for us. In glory at the return of Jesus, there will be family members who went on ahead of us. You know, I can't wait to see my great, 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 great grandfather who was the first Christian in my family. 
I'm a fifth generation Christian, and、uh, I can't wait to finally meet him and hear from his own mouth his testimony of how he came to know the Lord through the missionaries that came to Korea many, many years ago. And I can't wait to hear of how the gospel changed his life. His, the trajectory of our family and how he discipled his children and then their children and then their children down to my grandfather, my parents, and to me. And I can't wait to share in the fellowship the taste of heaven of being able to interact with and fellowship with these kinds of people. You see, we'll be greeted by people that we have prayed for. People we have shared the gospel to, people we have served and loved, even in small ways that we have forgotten. But Jesus has never forgotten. You see, if there is much grace that awaits us at the return of Jesus. So Peter says, focus on that grace, that there is much goodness, there is much grace that awaits us at the return of Christ. So he says, focus with conviction and clarity of mind, for you are a people of hope. So focus on that. Why does he keep stressing this? Because it is so easy to get distracted. Jesus speaks a warning against these types of distractions in our faith in Mark chapter 4. Look at Mark chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. He says, and others. Uh, and speaking of the seeds that are planted、uh, on different soils of our hearts and how we respond, he says, and others are the ones sown among thorns. So the word of God is planted amongst different types of soil, and this is planted amongst thorns. There are those who hear the word, but the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word. And it proves unfaithful. So, when the Word of God is planted in our hearts, when you hear the Word of God like this, and suddenly there is still a lot of worry in our hearts. The cares of the world, the worries of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, fooling you into thinking that this dust is real wealth. When we focus on these temporary things, and also it says in verse 9, verse 19, that we also, when we desire other things of this world instead of the things of the kingdom, when we focus on these temporary things, it says it chokes the word in us and we are not fruitful through the word. You see, these things distract us, and that is how the enemy works. To detour us from being fruitful for his kingdom, deceiving us into thinking that the temporary toys of this world are the true treasures, to deceive us into longing after and chasing after the popularity things of this world instead of things eternal. And so it distracts the life of a believer. You see, these things deter us and they take our eyes off of Jesus, and then we forget the grace that will be ours. You see, Satan's aim is distraction. Why? Because distraction will weaken conviction. Because if you lose focus on the battle that is in front of you, it is only a matter of time before you are ineffective or you die. Because if you are in a war, you better know why you are there, who you are fighting for, and what your objective is. If you're in war, you don't get sidetracked by the pool party that you happen to walk by. 2 Timothy 2:4 says, "No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer." So men and women of God, true children of God, are marked with a faith that understands that Christ, at His return, will restore all things. He will give us greater things at His revelation, and so we need to focus upon Him instead. There is a focus that is needed in our life of faith, and that focus should be centered around Christ and His kingdom, because that is our goal. That is our prize. And that is our hope. So, life of hope is one key trait 
of children of God. And there's a second trait that he highlights here, and that is that we are to live a life of holiness. So everyone repeat, live a life of holiness. Right, so not only will God's children be marked with hope, we will also be marked with holiness. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14 to 16. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So how are we to live as children of God? It says in verse 14, as obedient children, his children obey. And they delight in his word, as the psalmist tells us. You see, there's a connection between obedience and love. John 14, 15, if you love me, you will obey what I command. But what are we to obey? Peter says, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Instead, be holy. The other time that this term, do not be conformed, is used in the New Testament is where? Romans 12, right? Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So instead of conforming to the pattern and the passions of this world, we are to conform to the image of God, looking like our Father in heaven. Now, what's interesting here is that he says, do not be conformed, in verse 14, to the passions of your former what? Ignorance. Now, that's very interesting that he highlights that above everything else. That there is a way that ignorance of Jesus and his grace will affect what we desire. Okay, so ignorance, a true knowledge, and a true growing knowledge of who Jesus really is. That ignorance of God and the gospel, that will have a direct effect on what we desire. If we desire the things of this world, it's not just a purity issue, it's a theology issue. Because that is a reflection of how much we truly know this God of Scripture. You see, ignorance is not bliss, as the world will say. What we don't know can harm us. You know, one time I was on a mission trip to a uh, in this one smaller country in Asia, and the city that we were doing ministry in was still developing, and there was city life, on one side of the street and you literally cross the street and on the other side is uh, farming areas. And that's very common in a lot of the developing worlds. And uh, after our team did their morning exercises and we were doing our quiet times, I was sitting outside the stairs of the area that we were um, housed in and I could look across the street and I could see the divide. One side of the street, city, one side of the street, farming uh, communities. And so every morning uh, there would be this huge truck that makes a lot of noise uh, driving down the middle of that street. And that truck would release this huge smoke cloud. And when I asked what that was to a local, he said, oh, that's pesticide. And so I see this huge smoke cloud coming out of this truck as it releases pesticide down this street. Now, the thing, now that was disturbing in and of itself. But what was more disturbing is every morning as this pesticide truck would release this huge smoke cloud in the back, uh, you would see the neighborhood children, about 50 or 60 kids, running after the cloud. They would be playing in the cloud, jumping, screaming, running after the truck so that no matter where the truck turned, these kids would also run after it. And I, once I found out what it was, I wanted to say, but I could not speak their language, kids, what are you doing? Right? That is not something you play with. That is poison. You keep breathing that in, it's going to eventually kill you. Their ignorance was not bliss. Their ignorance could kill them. And that is the same message that Peter has for us. 
He's saying, don't pursue the former passions of your ignorance when you did not know Christ, when you did not know the gospel, and your value system was exactly the same as the world. Don't pursue the former passions of your flesh because it's not something to play with. It's something that's going to kill you. Sin will kill you. Sin will kill your joy, it will kill your integrity, it will kill your passion for Christ, and eventually it will kill your soul. Therefore, we must crucify the flesh as we surrender our sins at the foot of the cross. For the only way to deal with sin is to kill it before it kills you. How? By giving it to the one who was killed on the cross for those sins. And the only way to continually die to sin is by taking up our crosses daily as we follow, trust, and treasure Jesus who carried his cross for us. Ignorance is not bliss, it is deadly. We often will hear the phrase as well, what you don't know won't hurt you. That is also wrong. When what we don't know can not only hurt us, it can destroy us forever. When people don't know the gospel, that ignorance of Christ and the gospel can destroy their souls for all of eternity. And that is why we must point people to Jesus. And that is why Peter stressed last week that the point of our lives is to point people to Christ. Amen? So look at 1 Peter 14 and 15 again. It says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But how are we to obey? But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. He calls us to be holy. Now, this no, does not mean be a monk or a nun. I don't know, maybe God may be calling you some of it, to some of that. That's between you and God. But that's not what holiness means. It simply means to be set apart from the world, to look more like Jesus. Set apart different from the value system of the world. Ho holiness is simply the basic family values, virtues, and cultural norms of God's family. You see, all families have their own unique customs, Right? A lot of my Asian family friends when I was growing up in the suburbs of Chicago, uh, it was part, not just Korean Americans, but also my Chinese friends and Japanese ethnic friends. Um, a lot of my Asian friends, it was part of their family culture that when you walk into their house, you take off your shoes. And that's how I grew up too. So it was no big deal. But a lot of my Caucasian friends that were also my neighbors, when I would go over their house, you keep your shoes on. And for me, it was so uncomfortable the first several times that I did that. At first, I thought, this is pretty cool, right? I can keep my shoes on. But then it kind of hit me. I was like, dude, we just came from some pretty dirty places, you know? And so I'm just thinking, man, we just walked through that stuff. And now I'm walking through it. Hey, if you're cool with it, I'm cool with it, right? Um, but hey, you know, that's different cultural norms. So that's fine, right? And also other family values and virtues that were different. Some families that I know that for dinner, everybody ate together, right? The family eats together. No TV, no eating alone in your room. The family eats together for dinner. That was the cultural norm for their unique family's uh, situations. Other families had date nights, pizza nights, movie nights. It's built within their culture to do and to value certain things. And holiness is basically the essence of saying, this is how God's family looks like. These are the virtues, the values that God upholds within his family. That's another way that we could look at holiness. So it is in essence saying that we are set apart from the world's values because we value the things of God and his kingdom. So you value in his family, in his kingdom, forgiveness over bitterness. That's what holiness looks like. That's what his family looks like. We value excellence over laziness. We value generosity over stinginess. We value passion over apathy. Because as Paul 
encourages the church in Rome to be zealous always in your faith. Did you know that that was a command? To be zealous for the Lord. To be passionate for the Lord. That that is a cultural norm within God's kingdom. Amen? That that is not set apart just for leaders of the church. That is the basic norm of the people of God and the children of God. So that's a virtue, a value of what the family of God looks like. Passion over apathy, a love for justice, over settling for the norms of evil, racism, hypocrisy of the day, right? We value these things. These are kingdom values, and these are traits of God's family. You see, this is what our Father in heaven looks like. And what he desires is for his children to resemble him as well. You see, in families, the children resemble the parents, like father, like son, like mother, like daughter. You know, one of the things that I was most excited about at the birth of my son Enoch was to dress him up in Dallas Cowboys clothes. Um, I couldn't wait for him to wear the same jerseys that I had waiting for him years in advance. Um, I wanted him to look like me. I wanted him to love the things that I love. And that is God's heart for you. He wants you to look like him. He wants to dress you in his favorite clothes, the robes of righteousness. He wants you to look more like Jesus. That is why he says, be holy as I am holy. And that's like me telling Enoch, love the cowboys, because I love the cowboys. It is a desire for the child to emulate and embody the image, the values, the hearts of the Father. That is what God's heart means when he says, be holy. It's not a cosmic killjoy. It's not saying, hey, don't do the fun stuff. You got to do what I want you to do. No, he's saying, no, you don't understand. This is the best for you. This is wisdom for you. This is protection for you. This is purity for you. This is glory for you, for those who walk in this path. Amen? You see, the call to holiness is a call to begin emulating and exhibiting our Father in heaven. Be holy in all your conduct, he says in verse 15. Show kingdom values in all that you do. Resemble God, our Father in heaven, in all that you do. Verse 16, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. It's about being sanctified, purified, and set apart. But you see, we are only holy in Christ and because of Christ. Therefore, dwell closely with Christ daily. Walk in the Spirit. And when we fall, which we will do, Many times on this side of eternity. When we fall, we crawl back to the cross. That's how the children of God respond to our failures. Amen? When you fall, and you will fall, it's time to crawl back to the foot of the cross. Because only He can forgive and only He can change us and restore us again. So children of God will live a life of hope that grace is coming, that the best in all the world is coming. And we live a life of holiness set apart because we desire to resemble our Father in heaven. And there's a third trait of children of God that Peter highlights in this passage. And he says that children of God live a life of honor. Severin repeat, live a life of honor. So let's look at 1 Peter 1, 17. And if you call on him as father, so again, this is all in the context of a father-child relationship. So if you call God father, then this is the lifestyle that we are to follow after. So if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. So if God is our father... He is saying, don't forget, he is also our judge. If you call him in his father, who judges impartially. He's saying this, just because we can be comfortable with God as children of God, does not mean 
We are to be comfortable in our sin. Don't let comfort with God be a reason to compromise and be comfortable in our sin. Instead, he says, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Now, the fear of God here is not talking about be scared of God, be afraid of God in that way. It's not talking about run away from God in trembling. It means having deep respect and honor for God. It's because you respect God, you want to honor him in the choices that you make. Conduct yourselves with fear can also be said, live your life for the honor of God in all that you do. You see, a life of honor is also revealed by our integrity, who we are in the secret place. You know, one uh, survey results about pastors that I did not share during our How to Pray for Your Pastor series um, was something extremely disturbing for me. And I want to share that to you. I was so heartbroken to learn in this one survey that the highest rates of hotel porn consumption, of people purchasing porn through their hotel TVs, happens whenever there is a pastor's conference in town. I did not say when there is a Christian conference in town. I said when there is a pastor's conference in town. And a friend of mine actually worked in the hotel industry, and he verified that when I shared with him. I was like, I shared, I was like, dude, I cannot believe this. Uh, did you, you know, what was it like when you worked in the hotel? He, he said it was the same thing. Whenever there is a Christian gathering and their hotel was packed with pastors, Christian leaders, church leaders, the purchasing of porn skyrocketed. And that broke my heart. You see, that shows us that they forget that even though they're in a hotel room alone, they are not really alone. They forget that even though they are alone, or that they are traveling, that they are still representing Christ to a watching world. You see, we don't avoid porn because it's bad, and that's true, it is bad, and we should avoid it. We don't avoid porn because we don't want to get caught. We avoid porn because we love and honor God. And because we love and honor these women who are made in the image of God. That is why we avoid porn. Amen? Then also Peter says in verse 17, Conduct yourselves with this kind of fear, respect, honor, reverence throughout the time of your exile. Now, that's very interesting that he uses the word exile here. Meaning, remember that we are all exiles here, that we are passing through this world onto our eternal home with Jesus, that we are not home yet. So don't get comfortable here, as if this is your final destination. It's not. We are not home yet. So don't chase after the things that the world chases after. You are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I can't wait to see my home that Jesus is preparing for me. The places that we will dwell with for all of eternity, that Jesus has been preparing for us since the time that he ascended back into heaven, it will be places far more glorious, far more mind-blowing than anything that you ever seen on this fallen planet. Amen. And I can't wait to have you over. And I can't wait to visit your dwelling place for us to fellowship together and to fellowship with Jesus in our eternal glorious dwelling. And the other reason we are to have such high respect and honor for God is found in verse 18 and 19. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, 
like that of a lamb without blemish or spots. So we are to live a life of fear, of honor, of respect, because Christ's precious blood was shed for us. You see, in the Old Testament times, slaves would be ransomed or bought out of slavery from relatives or loved ones. They would obviously use money, or like silver or gold. But Jesus bought us out of slavery with something far more valuable. He paid for our freedom through the spilling of his blood. He died for us. He died for us. You And we've heard that so many times that it's become numb, but pray that the reality of that truth will impact your heart again, that Jesus died so that you would not die for all of eternity. He was the sacrificial lamb without blemish, meaning perfect sacrifice, perfect in all things. You see, when soldiers take a bullet for others in battle, we hail them as heroes. In fact, the highest medal that you can get in the U.S. military for showing valor, bravery, courage, going above and beyond the call of duty, the highest medal that you can gain in the U.S. is called the Medal of what? Honor. Every hero film is about someone saving others from death or danger. They depict heroes as those who give up their lives for others. And we honor them. We honor these men and women in uniform. We honor these men and women in movies. We honor them with plaques and statues. We find ways to remember them, commemorate them, and to honor them, for they made the ultimate sacrifice. But there is one man who has made the greatest sacrifice on behalf of others that deserves the greatest honor in all the world forever. And his name is Jesus. He deserves all glory, honor, and praise. Amen. He bought our freedom. We are no longer slaves. We are no longer slaves to sin only because of Jesus. We are free from its power and its grip only because of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Therefore, we love him, we honor him, we respect him, we fear him, we obey him. 1 Peter 1, 20 and 21, He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through Him are believers in God, who raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. All of this was done for us, that our faith and our hope might be in God. This is the great hope for all who are under persecution. Not only will it end one day, but when your life does end on earth, you will enter eternal glory with Jesus forever. We are a people of hope. So do not despair. This dark chapter in your life is not the final chapter. The loss of your loved one will one day be erased when you see them again face to face, all because of Jesus. Because Christ conquered sin and death, you, Christian, are the most admired in all of creation, are the most thankful because of his grace, are the most courageous because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. There is hope for the people of God. There is always hope for the people of God. There are greater days coming always for the people of God. God is working in ways that we cannot see. God is working things all for his glory. And so you need to fight the fight of faith in your heart to see through the darkness, to hope in the lights who will come one day 
and make right all things. That is why God's children respond to the circumstances of life differently than the world does. We react differently because we live in a different kingdom. It is a kingdom marked by hope. It is a kingdom marked by holiness. It is a kingdom marked by honor. And that is not just what God's kingdom looks like. That is what his family looks like. So may that kingdom culture, may that family culture become our culture here too. So that your life will begin emulating and reflecting the goodness, the glory, the holiness, the beauty, and the grace of our Father in heaven. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for the great grace that you have given us in Christ already and also for the grace that is still to be revealed at the return of Christ. And God, we long for that day. And Father, I pray right now for a strengthening of faith and a strengthening of hope within the hearts of your people here today that we will not respond and react like the world does but we would be a people marked with strong hope because our God is stronger than anything that we will ever face. So God, let hope grow. Let hope arise in the hearts of your people here. And Father, I also pray that you would give us wisdom and understanding to know the beauty and the wisdom of holiness that we would not long after the things that we long after in the ignorance of our flesh. But now as a people of faith, we would know that in your wisdom, your ways are the best ways. So may we cherish purity, holiness, and we pray for this generation and its youth, this internet and this addicted generation. We pray for a purity revolution. Men and women, boys and girls who will stand for the things of your hearts. And so let us be a generation marked with fear of God with honor for God as the motives of all that we do. For the glory, honor, and praise of your name. May that be the mark of our lives. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory without faults but with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, praise, power, authority, honor, be yours. Before all time, may that be yours to your people here today. And may that be yours forever. Amen. Oh, 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 oh,